and then. Great, yes. Um, so once again, welcome to everyone. Thank you, Senator, for leading the, on this important discussion. I just wanna do a quick final housekeeping items. Again, keep yourself on mute uh, unless you are ready to ask a question during our Q&A portion. In order to ask a question, just put your name in the chat and let me know that you want to ask the question and I'm going to keep a list in the order that I receive them. Also, as a reminder, we are recording this session and this is an open press event. After the Q&A um, session with uh, participants, press will have a 10 minute Q&A at the end. So that's the order we'll go to. And now I'm really excited and pleased to hand it over to Senator Tim Kaine, who's been doing some great work here on the Hill on voting rights, and he will let you know where we stand and some of the work that he's been engaged in. So, Senator, over to you. Well, well, so much. Many of you know Corinne is my state director, which means that she's essentially my deputy chief of staff, but also in charge of my six state offices, all of our constituent outreach and engagement with um, important uh, groups of constituents around the Commonwealth, and she does a superb job. Um, I, I wanted to do this today because I believe that next week is probably going to be the most important week that I'll spend in the Senate. Uh, next week was traditionally scheduled as a Martin Luther King Day recess. We would be off next week. But Senator Schumer, the majority leader, has decided to scrap the recess. And after the celebration of the MLK Day holiday on Monday, we will return to the Senate on Tuesday to begin a debate about voting rights. I want to thank um, all uh, who are on this call. We've got leaders from around the Commonwealth, NAACP state leadership, NAACP chapters, um, urban league leaders, um, legislators and other public officials, uh, representatives from key fraternities and sororities um, in Virginia. And I think we're gonna have a good discussion. And what I wanna do is really take some time to lay out exactly what's going on right now because Senate procedure is very, very bizarre. There, there's no legislative body in the country or really in the world that sort of operates under the same set of rules as the United States Senate. And so this is a discussion that's not only about voting but it's gonna involve some very fundamental questions about Senate rules and the question of what is more important, Senate rules, which the Senate can change and has often changed over time, or protection of voting rights, indeed the very protection of the democracy that we take an oath to protect. All of this is going to be at stake um, next week. Um, I'm going to ask Corinne and other staffers of mine to post up in the chat their contact information because we will have a QA and a at the end of this, but in case he doesn't get a question answered or you think of one later, I want you to know who to reach out to. Okay, so here's, here's what's going on. Um, all of you on this call know um, the, the, the painful chapter of voting in this country and the systemic exclusion of many people from being able to participate in elections, either to vote or to run for office. And you can basically track the history of this country um, in terms of who has been allowed to vote. The 15th Amendment saying that African Americans couldn't be barred just because they were African American. The, the, uh, the Jim Crow era, uh, the Virginia Constitution of 1901 and many other constitutions trying to disenfranchise African-Americans through stunts and schemes. The 15th Amendment wouldn't allow just an outright prohibition against African-American votes. But if you could put schemes in place that would disenfranchise African-Americans, the 15th Amendment was not held to block that. Um, the passage of the 19th Amendment to give women the franchise. The, the battles over civil rights laws in the 1950s and 1960s. The, the Voting Rights Act of 1965, after a 60-day filibuster on the Senate floor, the Voting Rights Act passed. It was, it was passed at a time of massive disenfranchisement. It was passed after an act of violence, the beating of John Lewis on the Edmund Pettus Bridge. Thankfully, it was passed with strong bipartisan support, in fact, Republican support for the voting rights of 1965, and the Senate was stronger than Democratic support. That act has been repeatedly reauthorized in Congress by wide bipartisan majorities as recently as 2006. But the Voting Rights Act was dealt a very critical blow in 2013 
by the case of Shelby versus Mississippi. And I, I know everyone on the call knows this, but just in case for some members of the press or whatever, if, if this isn't you know, your normal beat, what Shelby did was it took a core provision of the Voting Rights Act, the preclearance provisions that required jurisdictions where there had been a history of voting rights violations, primarily in the South, it required them to pre-clear any changes to voting. So in Virginia or in Richmond, when I was a state and local official, if we wanted to make changes to voting, we would have to submit them to the Justice Department 90 days prior to the implementation date. The Justice Department would ask questions and normally they would not object and then the changes would go into place. But that pre-clearance mechanism protected against efforts to uh, disenfranchise people. The Supreme Court in the Shelby case struck down the, the formula, not, not the preclearance mechanism, but the formula over that said which jurisdictions had to get preclearance. And it told Congress that Congress had to fix the, um, deci the decision-making about which jurisdictions had to seek preclearance. I was in the Senate in 2013. We went back to the Republicans knowing that they had been strong supporters of the Voting Rights Act. And we found to our surprise there had been a fundamental change in the Republican Party from 2006 to 2013. I basically put that change as a reaction to the election of President Obama. Um, and, and in 2013, many of the Senate Republicans who had voted to reauthorize the, the Voting Rights Act were still in the Senate, probably 30 of them were, but none of them, not a single one, would sign on to a simple, even-handed, fair fix of the Voting Rights Act in the aftermath of the Shelby decision. Once jurisdictions didn't have to pre-clear voting changes, many jurisdictions started to put up new obstacles and schemes and stunts to deprive people um, in subtle but surgical ways of their rights to vote. Um, and we didn't have the pre-clearance tool that could provide a, a, a protection against those disenfranchising efforts. Many states did this in the years after 2013, and there was sort of an increasing crescendo of efforts to disenfranchise people. But that crescendo really hit warp speed with the election of Donald Trump as president in 2016. As you know, he came into office claiming that the American election system was fraudulent, that he had really won the popular vote, that millions of people had fraudulently voted in Virginia and elsewhere. Um, he, he led a concerted campaign to undermine the integrity of American elections, driven largely by his own embarrassment at the fact that he had lost the popular vote. Um, and that led other states to then start to repeat the big lie about voter fraud and put more um, obstacles in people's way to participate. The warped speed of uh, disenfranchisement uh, upped significantly in November 2020, there was a historic turnout in the presidential election. Donald Trump lost by 7 million votes and then went on a concerted campaign to demean that election outcome, to file dozens of meritless lawsuits challenging the election outcome, to, to trash election officials in the states where he had lost in such an extreme degree that they even faced significant threats of violence to actually call the Georgia election office and say, you need to find me X thousand votes, the precise number of votes that he would needed in order to win Georgia rather than lose. When all of those efforts failed, the efforts to demean the election, the efforts to attack election officials, the efforts to directly and illegally solicit votes from election officials, uh, President Trump then invited followers to come to DC for something wild on January 6th, the attack on the Capitol, you all know it, you all watched it. But what exactly was that attack about is really important because many in Congress are now saying, you know, it was a protest, it was mostly a peaceful protest. Some will acknowledge that it was violent. Some will acknowledge that those violent attackers who injured 150 police officers and some died were terrorists. But what they usually will not say is that it was violence for a particular purpose. That attack was on a day at an hour for a dangerous purpose to, over, to stop the peaceful transfer of power and thereby disenfranchise the 80 million people who had voted for Donald Trump and Kamala, for Joe Biden and Kamala Harris. 
It was the biggest single day disenfranchisement effort in the history of the United States. The largest disenfranchisement effort, of course, was the, his, the historical disenfranchisement of African-American voters. But at least a one day disenfranchisement effort, the attack on the Capitol was an effort to disenfranchise 80 million people by disrupting the peaceful transfer of power. In the aftermath of that attack, many state legislatures in about 19 states, thank goodness Virginia is one of them. I see Hala Ayala and I'm gonna give her and her colleagues praise in a second. I think we might have some other state legislators, but before I get to Virginia, about 19 states around the country have um, basically picked up Donald Trump's big lie that the 2020 election with robust turnout was fraudulent, that the election was stolen, that it was rigged, that people voted who were dead, that people voted who were not eligible to vote. And they have picked up that mantra, the Donald Trump big lie. And although they may not be using flagpoles and fence posts to batter police officers or wearing Camp Auschwitz t-shirts or waving Confederate flags, they are acting in state legislatures all around this country to impose new restrictions on the right to vote. And the states where they're doing this, they're not a random assortment of states. This is not a partisan call, but I have to just be factual. The only states where this is happening are states where both legislative houses and the governor's mansion are held by Republicans. And they are driven by a fidelity to the Donald Trump big lie, and they are undertaking efforts to block people's rights to participate with a variety of stunts and schemes that are really dizzy. I mean, to, to give you examples, I think people are familiar <clears throat> with the example in Georgia where they've uh, made it a penalty to hand out water or food to somebody waiting in an election line. Now in Georgia, the election lines in minority neighborhoods and metropolitan areas tend to be very long. In suburban or rural communities, they're very short. So in order to vote, this is already an inequity that people should have to wait hours to vote in some parts of the state and minutes in other parts of the state. But to say that somebody can't hand you a bottle of water if you're waiting for two hours in line and that you would be subject both to jail and a fine if you were to do that is a cruel form of intimidation. Georgia has also passed a law giving the right to any Georgia resident to challenge the voting credentials of anyone trying to vote on election day and mandating that that challenge must lead to an administrative hearing before a local election board. And so just imagine you're waiting in line and somebody comes up to you and they don't like the way you look or they make a prediction about who you might vote for and they say, I'm gonna challenge your credentials. You then are faced with the requirement that you have to appear at an administrative hearing before a local election board who may or may not be friendly to you to demonstrate your bona fides to vote. Even if you're completely able to be successful, the hassle of having to do that would be enough to intimidate or push some people away from voting. In addition, Georgia um, officials, Georgia Republicans, largely in the, in the special election for the Senate, in January of 2006, they challenged their credentials of 370,000 voters. So imagine these hardworking and low paid election officials having to hold 370,000 administrative hearings to respond to these challenges. It's, it's a way of burdening them so they can't do the job. Georgia has also put in place mechanisms whereby the state can selectively audit jurisdictions, Fulton County where African-Americans are a sizable percentage of the population, where democratic vote is high, will get audited, but other jurisdictions won't. Georgia has also put in place mechanisms to allow the partisan legislature to take control of the outcome, calling the winner away from the duly sworn election officials in the state. These stunts and schemes and disenfranchising efforts are going on all across the country. To give you another example, state of Montana, not a Southern state, not a state that was originally covered with pre-clearance requirement in the, um, in the Voting Rights Act. What's happening in Montana? My friend John Tester is the senator there. Uh, Montana has had automatic registration, same day registration for years. After the 2020 election, the Montana legislature, um, both Republican houses, Republican governor, uh, eliminated the same day registration that had been part of Montana election law for years. 
Montana also has a voter ID requirement. Now, Virginia has a voter ID requirement. You can have a voter ID requirement that is broad and even handed, but in Montana, the voter ID requirement allows things like concealed weapons permits to be used as effective voter ID, but not college student identification, not some forms of identification that are very commonly used on tribal reservations. And so if you take an ID requirement and you allow certain IDs to be used, but you bar other IDs from being used, you can carve away at portions of the electorate in a way that will skew the elections. In any event, 19 states around the country have passed laws already. And as state legislatures are about to convene across the country, many more are considering such legislation. I said I was going to compliment our Virginia legislators who were on this call. Virginia, by most measures, was one of the hardest states to vote in the country. No early in-person voting, no non-excuse absentee balloting. But when Democrats took control of both houses of the Virginia legislature after the November 2019 elections, the legislature in both 2020 2021 undertook a series of steps to make it easier to vote. And in just two years, in these nonpartisan rankings of ease of access to the ballot, Virginia has moved from 49th in the country to 12th in the country in terms of ease of access to the ballot. And that's a good thing. And it's important to point out that that is a good thing for small d democracy. It's not a partisan thing. The, the governor's race we just had um, produced an outcome that I wasn't happy with and my partisan had as being a Democrat. A Republican won the election. But, but the turnout went up by 25% over the governor's race four years earlier because we made it easier for people to participate. So while I wasn't happy with the outcome, I would say a 25% increase in voter turnout, that was a positive thing for small d democracy. And so voting rights, sadly, get seen as a partisan issue with Republicans undertaking efforts to kick people off the rolls and purge them. But protecting voting rights is not partisan. It's, it's, it could be good for Democrats, it could be good for Republicans, it could be good for independents, but it's definitely good for democracy. So in the, in the aftermath of the attack of January 6th, and then watching so many states try to utilize the Shelby decision in the absence of preclearance in a way to force through changes that disenfranchise people and undermine electoral integrity. We have been, since the beginning of the year, uh, looking to find a path forward on voting rights legislation. And this is where I come in. The two committees in the Senate that do work on voting rights are the Rules Committee and the Judiciary Committee. And I'm not on either of those committees, but I think I'm the only Democrat here who has done voting rights work as a civil rights attorney before I got into politics. I practiced law, as many of you know, in Richmond for 17 years. I was a civil rights lawyer, primarily housing discrimination cases, but I did some voting rights work, representing people with voting rights challenges, but also representing local governments trying to do redistricting. And as a mayor and then a governor, I was under the preclearance provisions of the Voting Rights Act. And that was fine. And I didn't mind preclearance. And we were glad to do it. And we wanted to know whether things we were doing would, would meet the standards of the Voting Rights Act or not. So in May, Senator Schumer asked if I would become involved in the battle for voting rights in the Senate because I had done voting rights because of Virginia's history. Sadly, some of the worst violations of voting rights in the country were perpetrated by Virginia senators who hold the seat I now occupy, Harry Byrd Sr. and Harry Byrd Jr. in the 50 years between 1933 and 1983. But I was also asked to get involved because I have known Joe Manchin, Senator Manchin, for many, many years. And my first task was get Joe Manchin to be a co-sponsor of a voting rights bill. At the time in May, there were two pieces of legislation out on the table, and Joe Manchin was not a sponsor of either. So I worked with Senator Manchin, and I worked with other colleagues between May and September to introduce something called the Freedom to Vote Act, which is the, the core bill that is now before us, the Freedom to Vote Act that has all 50 Democrats as co-sponsors, including Joe Manchin as an original co-sponsor. The second bill that's before us is the John Lewis Act, which is a bill that simply restores the preclearance provisions that were struck down by the Supreme Court in 2013. Those are the two bills that we are working on together. When we finally got all Democrats on board with these bills in September, the current Senate rules 
the, the way they've been used or really the way they've been abused in recent history. And I emphasize recent history because during much of the history of the Senate, this was not the case. But in recent history, the, the normally fairly rarely used device of filibuster requires you essentially to get 60 votes in the Senate to pass legislation, the supermajority. In the House, it's simple majority. In the House and Senate in Virginia, it's simple majority. And in most city councils and state legislatures, it's simple majority. But in the, in the Senate, the abuse over time of filibuster rules have led to a situation where you need virtually 60 votes to do anything, not only to pass a bill, you even need 60 votes to get a bill poised for discussion. I, I argue that that use of the 60 vote threshold is essentially like the gag rule. Many of you know the history of Congress in the 1830s and 1840s. There was a, a gag rule that prohibited even the discussion of legislation related to slavery on the floor of the US Congress. The filibuster rule is being used as a modern day gag rule, not only to stop passage of civil rights legislation, but even to stop discussion of civil rights legislation. And so, for example, I've been in the Senate now for nine years. We have never had a piece of voting rights legislation on the floor in the, for debate and discussion in the nine years that I've been here, because Republicans will not vote to proceed to the legislation. So we, um, knowing that we would, we would, under current Senate rules, we might need Republican support, after we put the Freedom to Vote Act together, Joe Manchin and I and our colleagues spent months talking to Republicans. We have these two bills. Republicans in the past have supported voting rights legislation. We would like your help. The answer was no. We, we would move to proceed to the bills on the floor of the Senate and Republicans would uniformly vote no, with the exception of Lisa Murkowski of Alaska, who will vote to proceed to the John Lewis bill. No other Senator on the Republican side will proceed either to the Lewis bill or the Freedom to Vote Act. We went to them and said, if you will vote to proceed to these bills, we'll guarantee you unlimited amendments, which is rare in the Senate. We, we would accept counter proposals. What would you do instead? What we've heard very bluntly from them is they're unwilling to do anything on voting rights and they're unwilling to do anything on campaign finance reform. And so once it was clear that we could not get any Republican cooperation, beginning in November, I have worked very hard with all 50 Democratic senators to see whether we might be willing to contemplate a change in the Senate rules to allow passage of voting rights legislation by a simple majority. We face two challenges. How can we get a bill up on the floor over this gag rule 60 vote requirement, even for debate? And how can we pass a bill if Republicans are not willing to help us out? And so we have been involved in a very intense discussion about the Senate rules, the history of the Senate rules, the history of changes in the Senate rules, um, and whether this is a time when such changes would be warranted because of the threat to voting and the threat to democracy. Beginning on Tuesday, we will begin that debate on the Senate floor. We have not been able to find Republicans who are willing to vote to proceed to our voting rights legislation, but we are utilizing a very obscure Senate procedure that allows the House to send us a message and the Senate can take up the message by a simple majority vote without the 60 vote motion to proceed threshold. Normally, House messages are ministerial. You know, we're going to go into recess uh, for August and we'll come back on the day after Labor Day or something like that. House messages often come over to the Senate and they're fairly ministerial. But there's no prohibition about the House message being used to do something more substantive. And so yesterday, the House took a very simple message. It was actually a message on NASA funding that had been drafted by Don Beyer, our Congressman from Northern Virginia. They took that very simple House message and they added into it the John Lewis Act and the Freedom to Vote Act as currently sponsored by all 50 Democratic senators and they sent it to the Senate yesterday. We're gonna take the weekend off for Martin Luther King weekend. We, we, we think, I think all the senators believe we need to go back home and, and get re-energized for this battle ahead. 
But then we're going to return Tuesday and we're going to start debating voting rights. The Republicans can't block us because we don't need to get 60 votes to have this debate. And we're going to start debating voting rights. And we may be on this debate for some time. The Voting Rights Act of 1965 was six weeks. The Civil Rights Act of 1964 was 60 days. I don't know how long we'll be on it. Um, we will be debating the challenge of the moment. We will be debating the obstruction that we see underway, both in the attack on the Capitol and state legislatures around the country. We will be debating the provisions of the John Lewis and Freedom to Vote Act and why they are good responses to the current danger threatening voting and threatening our democracy. And we'll also be debating the Senate rules. And here's the challenge right now. While we have all 50 Democrats who support the voting rights bill, the combined Lewis and Freedom to Vote Act, and we have the ability to debate the bill through this procedural mechanism we found, we don't yet have all 50 Democrats on board with willingness to consider changes to the Senate rules so that we can pass it by simple majority. Yesterday, President Biden asked for an opportunity to address the Democratic caucus. And he also asked for the opportunity to visit with two senators, Joe Manchin and Kirsten Sinem, who had not yet committed to, a, to an openness to rules changes. Um, in my view, it was unfortunate. Um, that meeting was set up, the president was set to come visit and his meeting with the two senators was on the calendar, but right before the president came and spoke to the Democratic caucus, Senator Sinema took the floor and gave a speech saying, I am unwilling to consider any changes to Senate rules. I, I would have hoped she would have at least listened to the president first but she gave a speech in which she said she is unwilling to consider changes to Senate rules. And Senator Manchin put out a statement shortly after saying the same thing. So we, we go into this debate as an uphill battle. We, we have enough votes to pass the bill because if, if we were to have a simple majority and all 50 Democrats were to vote yes, Vice President Kamala Harris would be the tiebreaker. If the rule was simple majority, we would win. But the, the current Senate rule under most scenarios requires 60 votes. And unless we have all Democrats willing to, for example, say, but on voting rights, we're changing the Senate rule. On voting rights, simple majority is sufficient. You need to get 60 votes. Changes of that kind are made often. In fact, um, Democratic senators were willing to make this very change a month ago. The nation was about to reach its debt ceiling. When that happens, Congress has to extend, extend the debt ceiling. Republicans in the Senate said they were not going to vote with us to extend the nation's debt ceiling. And so the Democrats, we all met and we agreed, well, look, if we get no Republican support, we will change the Senate rules to affirm the full faith and credit of the United States, the 14th Amendment to the Constitution, not only guarantees equal protection of the laws, but in Article 5 of the 14th Amendment, it says the public debt of the United States shall not be questioned. We believe we have a constitutional obligation to affirm the public debt of the United States. And so we basically told Senator McConnell, hey, if you don't provide votes to enable us to do this, we're going to vote to change the rules. Simple majority change the rules to affirm the public debt of the United States. My friend, Senator Raphael Warnock of Georgia has made this very, has asked this very pointed question. If affirming the public debt of the United States is an important enough priority, the Democrats would change Senate rules by ourselves, by simple majority to do it. Why isn't protecting the right to vote just as important? Why isn't protecting the right to vote just as important. And so we'll get into this debate next week. Uh, we'll start debating on Tuesday. We'll likely have a vote Tuesday or Wednesday about actually taking up the House message. We may well have debate on amendments uh, to the voting rights bill. At some point, we'll likely have a vote on a cloture motion. We'll move to bring debate to a close under current Senate rules that would require 60 votes. We won't get them. My expectation is at that point, Leader Schumer will say, 
We propose a new Senate rule just for voting legislation that a cloture vote shouldn't take 60, it should just take 50. And then we'll have a Senate vote on that. Um, and everybody will have to go on the record, 100 senators, every Democrat and every Republican will have to go on the record about their view of the importance of current Senate rules which have changed over time versus the importance of doing voting rights legislation. If you read any press accounts of where we are right now, they would suggest pessimism that we will ultimately be able to pass this bill. Um, they would suggest that Republicans won't lift a finger to help us, and I think that's accurate. And based upon the statements of two Democratic senators, Senators Manchin and Senators Senator Sinema, they would predict that we ultimately will fall just short of being able to get this done. But, but I'm a believer that epiphanies can happen and that surprises can occur and that people can have insights and change their mind. I saw it once in the Senate. In August of 2017, the Republicans had worked for eight months to repeal Obamacare. And they had done it with surgical precision and they had 52 votes. And all they needed under the reconciliation process that was being used at the time was simple majority to take health insurance away from 30 million people. The vote was undertaken in the wee hours of the morning and on a hot day in August of 2017. Senators Collins and Murkowski, two Republicans, had said they would vote with Democrats to not repeal the Affordable Care Act. That would have made it a tie vote. And so we had that vote. And Michael Pence, the then vice president, came to the chamber to cast a tie-breaking vote, excited and proud to be a tie-breaking vote to take health insurance away from 30 million people, which is almost unimaginable to me. But at the last minute, as you recall, it was about three in the morning, John McCain, who had been voting with the Republicans to repeal the Affordable Care Act, who had initially opposed Obamacare, but who had recently been released from the hospital after a glioblastoma diagnosis. John McCain walked down to the aisle and voted no. We're not going to repeal Obamacare. We're not going to take health insurance away from 30 million people. And it was a surprise. And it was a surprise that was driven by his own revelation while he was being treated for cancer, surrounded by a whole lot of other patients who were fighting for their lives, that taking health insurance away from people was not a good idea. While the Vegas odds about the outcome next week may not be great, I, I never, never give up on the prospect that illumination and epiphanies can occur. And I think you'll see some spirited, spirited debate um, about the most fundamental aspect of our democracy next week. And I'm gonna be thinking about this all weekend long and thinking about this is probably the most important vote I'm ever gonna cast in the US Senate. And whatever the outcome, this battle isn't over. The, the, you know, the movement of Dr. King that we always think about on Monday, it's not a movement that's in the rear view mirror. I mean, it's a movement that is underway. And, and win or lose on this, the, the, the journey will continue because even this bill, as good as it is, it's not, it's not the cure for all ails. Um, and so we'll have more work to do. But I wanted just to kind of brief you on this and on my role in it. Um, I, I, and the last thing I'll say before I open it up for questions is this. January 6th for me was a pivotal day in my life, um, an unforgettable one, a day never to be imagined and a day hopefully never to be repeated. It's not changed my personality and it's not changed my relationships, but it has changed my priorities. And um, some of you have heard me say this. I was extremely angry that day. There were many emotions, confusion, certainly. But anger was my dominant emotion. And I've been angry before in my life. There was plenty to be angry about that day. But it took me a number of months to, to really identify the source of my anger. And it wasn't until a number of months later that I realized this is why I was so angry that day. I'm a white male born in 1958. Nobody had ever tried to disenfranchise me. 
I'm a civil rights lawyer. I battled for People's Voting Rights Act my whole life, but I was always fighting for other people's voting rights because mine had never been threatened. Well, for about five hours that day, as there was an a, attempt to disenfranchise all 80 million people who had voted for Joe Biden and Kamala Harris, I had a little empathy window for a very brief moment in time to what many people have experienced their entire lives. That there's been a consistent and persistent effort to disenfranchise people of color for, for centuries, women for centuries, you know, immigrants for generations. And, and many, many have had that experience in a very personal way. And I, I had, and um, by the end of that day, the threat to me was over, I guess. And I was no longer jeopardized in the way that some are jeopardized today by these actions that are being undertaken in states all across this country and that, and that will happen more and more and more if we don't do something to stop it. But it, it sort of took what had been a priority for me and really turned it into an existential necessity because it's not just being disenfranchised as bad, that's horrible. But even the feeling that others wanna take away my right to vote that others don't think I'm worthy, that others want to exclude me is a horrible thing. And so that's why I'm so glad that I, would, I, I have jumped into this in an intense way. Um, next week will be an unusual week. We hardly ever have anything in the Senate that's not all pre-digested pre and completely predictable and everybody knows exactly how it's gonna go. The Senate used to have a lot more surprise to it, these multi-day, multi-week debates. The, the, the surprise has kind of been drained out of the legislative process here over some years. But next week, we ought to pray for some surprises and some twists and some turns. And uh, with that, um, I'm really glad we could do this this morning. And I appreciate you letting me talk about this at some length. But the Senate is such an unusual institution and the rules are so bizarre that I felt like I should go into some detail about what we're about to embark on. And with that, Corinne, I'd love to open it up and take questions. And Corinne, I'm assuming that you are gonna be maybe the traffic cop on the Q&A. Yes, Senator, thank you so much. Um, the first question is to um, President Barnett, the Virginia State Conference of NAACP. Hey, Mr. Good President. Morning. Good morning, Senator Kane. Thank you for your leadership in the Senate. Thank you for your leadership here in the Commonwealth. We are, are very, we are at a crossroads and now is the time that we um, step forward and make sure that voting rights cannot be taken away. And so my question, I, I just put it in the, in the chat that this is a very important issue. How do we fix it? Right, right now, Robert, the key is we have to figure out a way to persuade to persuade Senators Manchin and Sinema to place the priority of voting rights over adherence to Senate rules that have been changed frequently throughout our history and that can be changed. We, we have given to Senators Manchin and Sinema a number of possible rules changes. We can carve out an exception for voting rights and say voting rights can be done by simple majority, or we've actually given them a completely different set of changes. Um, let's return to the old talking filibuster. You know, if you've seen Mr. Smith goes to Washington, if, if you are in a minority and you want to uphold, if you want to stop the majority in the Senate from moving, then you take the floor and you try to persuade them they're wrong and you can hold the floor for as long as you want. But once you're done, if you haven't persuaded them, the Senate rules still say the vote would be by simple majority. So you only need that elevated 60 vote threshold for what's called a cloture motion, which is a motion to terminate debate. If you're in the middle of debate and you're not trying to terminate it, when debate is over, the vote is by simple majority. So we've gone to them and said, if you don't wanna change the, the cloture threshold, how about this? 
let's just return to talking filibuster, force all 100 senators just to be on that floor. Both sides should have to work. It's tough on both sides, but everybody's got to be on the floor. And we're going to do as much talking as we can. But as soon as everybody has spoken twice, which is allowed under the current Senate rule, then we'll go to simple majority. They haven't agreed to that either, but they haven't completely rejected it. So there are a couple of paths forward. And I, I, think, I think the key is less with Senators Manchin and Sinema getting into the the nuts and bolts of the Senate rules in the way that I have explained to you, because I wanted everybody to have context. But just what you said at the start of your question, we're at a crossroads now. We're at a crossroads and, and you have an opportunity to do the right thing or to put us on a path that's, that's the wrong path. And I think that, that's, that if, if we could make that argument, um, NAACP chapters, you know, your Virginia chapter has ties to the West Virginia chapter. Local chapters have ties to West Virginia chapters. Some of you might have ties in, in Arizona. I think in-state voices are the most important voices for these two senators to hear from. But, but again, because they are co-sponsors of both pieces of legislation, we can't give up, we can't give up on them. They don't like to change Senate rules, but it's not like they're opposing the bills. They, they, they are co-sponsors of the bill. So outreach to those two offices is really, really important. Awesome. Next, we have Eric Laville. Hi, Senator. Good morning. Good morning to everyone here on the call. Hey, Eric. Uh, my question is surrounding the um, realistic chances of the passing of those bills to restore the protections to voting rights. You've basically articulated the challenges that we have with some members on the Democratic side of the aisle and the reluctance of the other uh, legislators on the Republican side of the aisle. So from what I'm hearing is that there is not really a realistic chance of it really passing unless there is some change of heart or some event um, uh, pushing others uh, to really, you know, vote uh, for the good of voting rights. So with that being said, how do you, what is the perceived impact upon the midterm elections, uh, the rest of the Biden administration and the ability really to thwart advances of state legislators from restricting access to the voting box, such as states of, like Georgia, as opposed to uh, providing more protections and increasing access to the voting box like the Commonwealth of Virginia. Eric, you're, if, again, the, the Vegas odds are tough right now, not impossible, but if, if we cannot pass the Lewis and the Freedom to Vote Act, it basically will allow states to continue to do what Georgia and Texas and other states are doing and selectively fence people out from participating and also undertake other steps that demean the integrity of elections. Um, and that will, that will be ongoing. Now, the Justice Department still has the capacity under Section 2 of the Voting Rights Act to file lawsuits against jurisdictions. And they're in court all the time, uh, as are lawyers for the Democratic National Committee and the Senate Democratic Campaign Committee. We, we are in court all the time challenging states' actions if they, in violation of Section 2 of the Voting Rights Act, would have the intent and effect of diluting minority vote strength. And so that, that part of the Voting Rights Act is still there, but the Supreme Court has even narrowed section two down in the Brnovich decision this summer. You know, they basically say, look, the Voting Rights Act is, is meant to stop intentional disenfranchisement of African-Americans. If you say, yeah, I was just trying to hurt Democrats, not African-Americans, you know, the, the, the court is now moving to a position, well, that's okay, you can do that, even though the overlap between African-American vote and Democratic vote is you know, so significant. If you claim that you're doing it for partisan reasons rather than racial reasons, the Supreme Court seems to be accepting it. So what we would have before us, Eric, would be a strategy where we would have to rely on the Justice Department and courts, recognizing that the Supreme Court precedent is not as helpful as it used to be, and we would also have to rely on intense organizing in the states to try to have more states do what Virginia is doing and fewer states do what Georgia is doing. One of the things I'm going around and really using this Virginia message, hey guys, 
we just expanded the vote and a Republican governor won. This is not a partisan thing. If you broaden the franchise, it could be good for one party, it could be good for the other party. It's good for democracy. And, and we, may, we may need to make that argument. It's gonna be interesting to see whether in Virginia under a Republican governor now with a Republican house, will there be an effort to carve back the voting expansions that were done in 2019 and 2020? Um, I, I would hope that the Democratic Senate would block such an effort. But it might be that the Republicans would look at the increased turnout in November and say, you know, we fought like hell against all this stuff, but it's actually not so bad. So we might we might be able to use the Virginia example in some other states to help them broaden rather than restrict the franchise. So look, the, the best solution is for us to get this done at the federal level. But there are other litigation and state um, legislative paths. Your point about the, the Biden agenda in the midterms, I, I, I'm worried about that. Now, I'm more worried about the democracy than I am worried about any particular election. But I do worry about this effect. Um, Raphael Warnock in Georgia is very powerful in saying he's up for election in November of 2022, re-election of the Senate. He says if the Georgia laws stay in place, he thinks it's going to be virtually impossible for him to win. My friend John Tester in Montana, he's not up in 22, he's up in 2024. But he says what they've done to restrict youth voting and tribal voting, he said, you know, he hasn't made his decision about whether he's going to run in 2024 or not. But he says he wants to be able to make that decision on his own, not have the state legislature pass rules that say, oh, it's impossible for me, so I can't do it. Um, Mark Kelly in Arizona is up in 2022. The Arizona legislature is contemplating a number of challenges that will make it very hard for him. That's one of the things that makes it a little more difficult for me to understand Senator Sinema's position, because remember Arizona was one of the states where they tried to throw out the electoral votes. Arizona is one of the states where these schemes and stunts are being imposed in a way that will have an impact on her Senate colleague and friend this year. Um, and, um, and then there's a bigger effect on the midterms. If, if I mean, and I'll just say it, this way bluntly, if Democrats won't stand up for voting rights, there's a whole lot of other groups out there that hope Democrats will stand up for them. But if they see that we won't stand up for voting rights, they'll ask the question, wow, what's the chance they're gonna stand up on climate or minimum wage or LGBT equality or police reform? What's the chance that they're gonna stand up on immigration reform? What's the chance that they're gonna stand up to reduce the cost of college or broaden access to healthcare? This is going to send a powerful message, either that we've got a backbone and we're going to stand up for things we told people we would do if we had a majority, or to the contrary, they'll see it and suggest, wow, you know, the Dems got a majority for a particular reason, but on the fundamental issue of protecting people's voting rights, especially the people who voted for Democrats, right. if they're not willing for that. I mean, the, the, these efforts in states are being essentially directed at people because they were loyal to us, because they voted for us. And so the question is, are we loyal to them? The, the stakes are extremely high on this, not just on voting, not just on democracy, but on whether people believe that we, and, and look, we're not all the same. 48 out of 50 at least are gonna vote for this and zero Republicans will vote for it. But we gotta have all Democrats to protect the Democratic voters who are under attack right now. Thank you. Beth. Moving to Brenda Hall. Uh, good uh, morning, uh, Senator Kane. Uh, this is Brenda Hale, H A L E, from Roanoke. Good morning to you, sir. Uh, we, th we thank you for all of your dedicated service throughout the years. And uh, I want to speak to when the Supreme Court decimated the Voting Rights Act, we lost pre-clearance. Um, that was the state of Virginia also in the textbook example of why this was so important. Roanoke County moved its registrar's office out to Vinton, Virginia, way back in the woods. There is no access by bus. Uh, I guess you could take a taxi, but most minorities cannot 
get there. And without the teeth of pre-clearance, without this Voting Rights Act that everyone is fighting so hard for, including you and so many others, Senator Mark Warner and so many others. But the, this is critical that we put this back in place because what else can I fight with? Right. I have no teeth. You know, when I fight, I like to win. You know, that's a competitiveness in me. But right now as it stands, I have no teeth to stand and fight against this. Because everybody is saying, why can't the NAACP do something? You know, they just don't understand that we no longer have preclearance right. and we have something to fight with. Well, well, Brenda, I'm really glad you brought that up. And, and let me, I want to talk about the John Lewis Act and the preclearance question because when you when you hear what the John Lewis Act is, it is the most reasonable and even-handed restoration of preclearance possible. And yet we can only get one Republican, Lisa Murkowski, in the Senate and no Republicans in the House to support it. So so here was what preclearance was before the Shelby decision. The voting rights in 65 identified jurisdictions, primarily southern jurisdictions like Virginia, that had a history of excluding people voting based on race. And it said those jurisdictions have to pre-clear if they're gonna make changes to elections, moving the registrar's office, switching from a May municipal election to a November election, the state changing rules about absentee voting. If you were in one of those primarily Southern jurisdictions, you could pass a change, but you had to submit it 90 days in advance to the Justice Department and they had to look at it and vet it before it could go into effect. What the Supreme Court said in Shelby was not that pre-clearance was wrong. The, the Supreme Court just said, you can't assume in 2013 what you assumed in 1965, that it's only these specific jurisdictions that are bad actors that need to pre-clear. And so Congress, you need to come up with a pre-clearance formula about who needs to get pre-clearance that matches this moment not 1965. Now, there's a lot of argument about whether that Shelby decision was good or bad, but I, I could see some logic in it in this way. I grew up in Kansas. Kansas wasn't required to pre-clear, and Virginia was. In 2013, by 2013, it was easier for an African-American to vote in Virginia than Kansas. It was easier for an African-American to get elected to office in Virginia than in Kansas. And so some of the states that had required preclearance had made a whole lot of progress and some of the states that hadn't had backslid. So the Supreme Court said, you can do preclearance. You just have to fix the formula about who has to preclear. So guess, guess what we came up with? Now this is so even handed and, and I give Bobby Scott, Bobby Scott actually, because it was his role at that point, he was the you know, key Democrat on the Judiciary Committee in the house, he basically said, you know what? Let's eliminate anything about the geography and just have one rule for every community, north, south, east, west, midwest. If you had any voting rights violation in, in the last 15 years, then you have to seek preclearance. But as soon as you're 15 years past any voting rights violation, you don't have to seek preclearance. So you might be a bad actor in Montana. You weren't subject to preclearance originally, but you're going to be subject to preclearance until you have a 15 year clean period. And then you don't have to preclear until you commit another voting rights violation. And then you'll go back into the, the preclearance formula. Talk about even handed. I mean, there's nothing more fair or straightforward than that. You have to preclear if you've had a problem. You don't have to preclear if you haven't had a problem. We can only find one Republican who will vote for that bill in both houses. I mean, there's, I don't know, there's 230 Republicans or 250 Republicans out of the 535 in both houses. We can only find one who will co-sponsor that. Even though Republicans before Obama would vote to reauthorize the Voting Rights Act all, you know, all the time. The election of President Obama turned the Republican Party from a pro-voting rights party 
beginning in the 1860s, the 15th Amendment, the 19th Amendment, the Voting Rights Act of 1965, the 26th Amendment, 18 year olds could vote. All of those were done with overwhelming Republican support. Some were done in Democratic administrations like the 19th Amendment, Woodrow Wilson, but they had overwhelming Republican support. 2006 reauthorization of the Voting Rights Act, overwhelming Republican support. It was only after the election of Barack Obama that the Republican Party turned from a pro-voting rights act party into a party that does not even want to discuss it, much less support it, much less co-sponsor it. So the pre-clearance restoration piece of the John Lewis Act, it's as, in my view, non-controversial, logical, rational, fair way to do exactly what the Supreme Court said Congress should do, and we can only find one Republican who will stand with us to support it. Thank you. We'll go next to Vo Carpenter. It's great to be on with you, uh, Senator. Uh, my question uh, is more strategic because um, you know more of the tone of this conversation is this is a great bill. Uh, we should pass it. Most of the the caucus is for it, but it's probably going to fail. Uh, what what can we do between now and when a vote is held to try to apply pressure to some of your colleagues? Uh, to maybe sway their decision making, or at least make them take a second look at uh, why they are opposing the rule changes to pass this legislation. Vo, let me give you a sort of a little bit of a preliminary answer on that, because what I would like to do, and I may ask Corinne, some of you see on the on the screen, Tracy Hong. Tracy is my general counsel who works with me on all this voting rights work, and she and Corinne may strategize and get back to you a little bit on this. I think. Senator Schumer, together with the national civil rights groups, are meeting today to sort of plot out what's going to happen next week. And here, here's what I expect is going to happen. I think you're going to see um, different blocks of floor time taken on different issues. So, you know, there will be a block of floor time under the big lie that animated the attack on January 6th. There will be a block of floor time on here's what's happening in the 19 states. There will be a block of floor time on here are the provisions of the bill. One of the provisions of this is no secret money in campaigns. Every campaign contribution should be transparent so the public can know who's funding campaigns. And we may want to do a block of floor time on that. And I think what Senator Schumer and national groups will do is they'll, they'll try to coordinate activities of national groups like the NAACP, depending upon the blocks of floor time, maybe we'll have activists here at the Capitol who want to talk about campaign finance reform as we're talking about that, or activists from the 19 states that have passed bad laws here talking about that when we're on the floor talking about it. So I think the effort will be inside the chamber, it'll be intense, but there's going to be out the chamber component, some here in Washington, but some social media, some communities around the country and I think that strategy is being developed today. And I wouldn't be surprised if, and, and I know Hillary Shelton and the folks at the NAACP in Washington are very involved in those discussions. So I suspect NAACP will be putting out sort of thoughts about, you know, here's, here's, here's what would be helpful on which day next week. I mean, this will all begin Tuesday. Now the King family is doing activism this weekend. The King family, is doing a coordinated civil rights activity in Phoenix tomorrow. Interestingly enough, when the King family announced they were gonna do civil rights rally in Phoenix tomorrow, President Trump decided he wanted to go to Phoenix tomorrow to do something too. So there will be some dueling activity, but it's all gonna draw attention to this issue. And we gotta put everybody's attention on this issue. The King family is gonna be here Monday on MLK Day doing an event on the Frederick Douglass Bridge. So there will be activity in DC on Monday, but I think there is going to be a coordinated strategy. The NAACP is involved in that coordination. We'll probably send out information uh, quite promptly on that. But, but the other thing is anyone on this call, if you just kind of brainstorm, do you have contacts either in Arizona or, or um, West Virginia? that could be helpful in reaching out to Senators Manchin or Sinema. And again, they're not enemies in the sense that they're against the bills, they're co-sponsors of the bills. So that's halfway. 
know, you, we don't have to treat them like they're, you know, Harry Bird, you know, senior or something like that. They're, you know, they're co-sponsors of these bills. We, and they've taken a big step with us to do that. We just have to hopefully convince them to be willing to take a second step. And so the contacts that you would have in West Virginia and Arizona are, are important. So all we're gonna take just one last question from the public um, and then we're gonna move to Q&A for the press. But if you do have questions, Tracy is gonna drop in her, she did drop in her contact information. I dropped in my contact information, I'll do so again. And we'll be happy to answer your other questions. But the last question will go to um, Reverend Bailey. And I know there were others in the queue. I'm so sorry, time um, ran out, but we <laughs> promise to get back to you on your questions. Uh Thank you, Corinne. Good morning, Senator Kane and all others who are here. And uh, greetings from the Prince William branch of the NAACP. Uh, Senator, uh, the, the question ahead was very much related to the one that my colleague, uh, Bo, kind of, uh, Bo, just uh, asked and you answered. And, and so I want to pivot just a little bit. You know, those, the, the, the tactics that, that, that we are looking for, for what we can do, and you've uh, alluded twice to uh, reach out to possible contacts we have in either the state of West Virginia or the state of Arizona. Um, what, what, I'm, what I want to pivot to is that as I look at the, the party of opposition as, uh, you know, forgive my phrasing, as soulless ideologues, and, and I'm just curious, you've been in the, the Senate and we've been a part of putting you back there, you know, for, for a couple of terms. What is it that can crack through that particular stone wall for the party of opposition to those things that are of interest uh, to NAACP and, you know, more acutely, you know, what makes them tick that would actually get to the heart of uh, understanding the importance, the humanity of fairness in voter access? You know, I, I, would, I would comment, and I'd never speak for my wife who is an elected official, but I will say this is that at the local level here, she has had some success in reaching across the aisle, probably, you know, a C or a C plus because, you know, she reaches, she, she also faces that, but she's been able to figure that out. What is it in the Senate that could possibly work there, sir, and that we could, you know, assist you with? Cozy, it's a really good question. And, you know, that, that would be the subject of a, a, a complete hour long Zoom to, to really dig into it and answer it. But, but because now that I've been here nine years, I work very closely with Republicans on the Armed Services Committee, on the Foreign Relations Committee, on the Health Education Labor Pension Committee. You know, we, we I give you an example, Mitch McConnell. Mitch McConnell and I, a couple of years ago, met and said, you know what, with this e-cigarette thing, we should probably raise the tobacco age nationally from 18 to 21. And we're both from tobacco states. So rather than let somebody from other states do it, why don't we say, let you and I do it? And we worked on this bill that was in 20, I think it was in 2019. And we got it passed. And the CDC said when it passed that 250,000 fewer people would die of lung cancer as a result. We worked on that together. And there are other examples. We did an infrastructure bill earlier this year. There are items where we can work on together, but in the months in the fall where we, we all Democrats got on the bill and we were searching around to find Republican cooperation, uh, a, a very senior Republican who I'm gonna leave nameless for reasons you'll understand, kind of gave me the facts of life talk. And here's what she said. She said, Here's what he or she said. He or she said, Mitch McConnell is a very effective leader of our party. And one of the reasons he's effective is he gives us a lot of latitude. He says, follow your conscience. I may not agree with you. I may not support you. I may vote against you, but I'm not going to tell you don't follow your conscience except that I have two red lines. And my two red lines are, you cannot work with Democrats on voting rights and you cannot work with Democrats on campaign finance. Those are the only two red lines I have. 
do whatever else you want. Well, these two bills are both crossing red lines a complete disclosure of campaign contributions and voting rights. These are the two red lines that their leader has put up for them. They, they like the fact that he gives them latitude on everything else. Now, just because he says, I have a red line here, doesn't mean that no one will ever cross it. But under current Senate rules, we would have to get 10 Republicans to cross those red lines. There's not 10, there's not five. You know, on a good day to cross a McConnell red line, there might be two. But there's just not going to be a critical mass to enable us to do this. When we're on issues that aren't the red lines, look, if, if, we, if we lose on voting rights, we're not giving up on police reform. There are things we can do together on police reform. There's been a, an obstacle around this issue of qualified immunity that has, has thus far blocked a path forward, but there are things that we agree on. And, uh, you know, I'm either gonna have my best day in my Senate career or my worst day while we're underway, but whether I have my best day or my worst day on voting, I'm still gonna go to work the next day and try to find a path forward on things that I care a lot about, things that matter a lot to the NAACP. And I'm not, I'm not despairing of opportunities to find common cause. It's just on this set of issues, which is sadly, you know, the most important set of issues, the most urgent in terms of where we are as a country right now. It's only on this set of issues where we cannot realistically expect to find any assistance. Thank, Thank you so much for time today and um, reach out to Tracy or Corinne, and, and there may even be, guys, there may even be a need to, you know, do a little bit of a status update at some point along the way once we're in the debate, or there may be in response to Robert's questions as we get into the debate next week, hey, this would really be helpful. And if that's the case, you know, we'll, we'll be in dialogue about that. All right, thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. Senator, we do have press that have questions for you. So the first press question. I don't know. Okay. Yep. Um, I know the Richmond Free Press had a question. And then after the Richmond Free Press, press could unmute themselves and ask their question. Hi, Senator Kane. It's Bonnie Winston at the Richmond Free Press. Hi, everybody else on the call. Thank you all as the NAACP and other people who are concerned about voting rights. Uh, for fighting for these important um, for this important issue, um, I think the big question is: What else can we do as Virginians to try to push the ball in the right direction to get Senator Manchin, to get Senator Cinema, um, to get Mitch McConnell to stop this blockade? I mean, you've talked about it some, but um, I think somebody on the chat had a very good point of having President Biden um, to do a joint address of Congress um, to stress the importance of this. Um, it seemed from his the president's remarks yesterday that he had sort of given up, um, which was hard to take, frankly. Um, I think President Obama was a nice guy, but he saw kind of late in his four years that he had to play hardball. What can we do to play hardball? I, it seemed almost as though Biden felt that um, things would be different because he'd been a member of the Senate for so long. Mm -hmm. but, it, but I think to most of us out here in the world, we, we know that uh, th th that there's been a real uh, backlash for so long. Uh, so what can we do to help push things now? Um, Bonnie, it, it, um, you know, I, I think the combined weight of President Biden's speech in Atlanta Monday and then to the caucus yesterday, that, that was strong. But I will say, when, when the President of the United States says, I want to come and talk to the caucus, this is really important and it's on everybody's calendar. But then before 
they even listen to him, people are going out and basically saying, yeah, no matter what he says, I'm still doing something else. I, I think respect for the office would have suggested that it would have been wise to at least listen to the president before taking a definitive position. And I think, I think that happened right before the president walked into the room. And I think he was a little bit deflated by that. I mean, you know, you can, I, I always think about if I was the president, you could like me or not like me personally, I hope you would respect the office enough to at least listen to what I have to say. And remember, this is a president who has been, was in the Senate for 36 years. I mean, this is somebody who, if you want to talk about what Senate rules are, whether they changed over time or how important they are, I mean, not since LBJ have we had a president who understands the Senate of the United States better than Joe Biden. So I think that that was, that was tough yesterday to, to find that people had staked out definitive positions, apparently, before they were even willing to listen to him. Um, but the, op the option of a joint address to Congress is there. Um, I, I do think the, the ability to get any Republican votes is virtually nil. Again, there is one exception, the, the Lisa Murkowski on the Lewis bill, that, that there's a door open there, although she hasn't been supportive of the Freedom to Vote Act, and we now have merged those into one bill. So I do really think this is very focused on the, the, the two Democratic senators. And again, focusing on them with the beginning point that they are co-sponsors of the bill. So you're not having to convince them that the bills are a good thing or that they're, they're needed. You have to, we have to convince them that the rules which have been changed over time. Um, it's not uncommon, for example, for Joe Manchin to talk about Robert Byrd, who was the majority leader of the Senate, longest serving US Senator. Robert Byrd changed over time. He was a Klansman. Robert Byrd was a Klansman in the 1940s. Robert Byrd led the filibuster to the Civil Rights Act of 1964. He gave a 14 hour and 13 minute speech on the floor of the Senate in 1964 to filibuster against the Civil Rights Act of 1964. He helped lead the filibuster against the Civil Rights Act of 1965. But then he rethought his position. He voted for the Fair Housing Act in 1968. He then became a civil rights champion progressively between 1968 and when he died in the Senate in 2010. And President Obama said about Robert Byrd when he died that he was a man with the courage of his convictions, including the courage to change his opinion over time. Changing your opinion takes courage. Changing your opinion takes courage. And Robert Byrd was willing to do it. And Bonnie, I, I'm, I'm struck by the difference between Robert Byrd and the two Harry Byrds. I occupy the seat in the Senate that was occupied by Harry Byrd Sr. and Harry Byrd Jr. from 1933 to 1983. And they weren't Klansmen, but they were just like Robert Byrd in their, in their voting records in the Senate on civil rights issues, except that they never evolved. They never changed their mind. They never apologized. They never became champions for civil rights. As a result, around this place, we still talk about Robert Byrd, but in Virginia, you know, the Harry Byrd Middle School in Henrico has been changed to the Cuyacuson Middle School and the Harry Byrd School of Business at Shenandoah University. They've taken Harry Byrd Jr.'s name off that, even in his hometown, the Harry Byrd statue on Capitol Square has been taken down. None of us are perfect. I mean, we can all have viewpoints that are wrong. And if we have courage and pay attention to the world, we can change our minds. And, um, and so I'm thinking heavily about that, occupying the, the bird seat in the Senate that was used to filibuster civil rights legislation often during the 1950s and the 1960s. And I think, you know, advocacy for Senators Manchin and Cinema, that we really appreciate your support for these voting rights bills, but just being co-sponsors and allowing them to fall short and allowing people to be victimized by schemes designed to reduce their participation, you know, we need you to go farther than just being co-sponsors. Um, I, I acknowledge that a Richmond newspaper, you know, might not have the, the you know, the direct line in to, to persuade a, a West Virginia or a Arizona Senator, but 
you know, as, as Doug Wilder used to always say, when the thing is right, the time is right. And the thing is right. So making the, making the point to the best of your ability. And then all those who do have contacts in, in West Virginia or Arizona saying, thank you for co-sponsoring these bills. Go the final mile with us. Other questions from the press? Uh, good morning, Senator Kane. This is uh, Alex Scribner. Uh, I am from Dogwood News. Um, I just wanted to throw out that I love. Uh, I'm sorry. I, I'm, I love seeing. Uh, I love seeing all of these uh, women running Virginia because our uh, paper is devoted to uh, voting and women. So I'm just loving all of this. Anyway, um, as we know, like funding uh, can affect a broad swath of things for example um the transportation funding that's coming in could potentially help the uh get the roanoke county citizens from out to Vinton potentially to go vote and stuff like that so basically my question is you talked about uh working across the aisle and that sort of thing what do you see your role as in um the state government and helping uh the federal funding get to those in need and not quote undo the process as we have a uh, Republican-led executive and a split General Assembly. No, no it's, a, it's a great question. It's, it's interesting to have passed this transformative infrastructure investment. It's just going to bring billions and billions of dollars to Virginia for road, public transit, rail, airport, port, broadband, power grid, offshore wind, and a Republican governor is going to get to do you know most of the the groundbreakings and ribbon cuttings, but that's okay. It's going to help. It's going to help Virginians. Now, most of these dollars um, go from the uh, federal level to the kind of appropriate state agency. So, like the road and bridge money goes to the Commonwealth Transportation Board. That is a board that has your, you know a, a project list already. They're going to get vastly more dollars than they've been used to. And so they'll either be able to do many more of their projects that they have on the current list faster or be able to think of new projects. And, and we included in the allowable uses of funds, things like you know, rail to trail, and bicycle trails. I mean, we, we put broad so that states and cities and counties could have real flexibility to use them the best way possible. So I think, I think the key for any Virginia activist who wants to make sure that the transportation dollars are used for the right projects or that the right, you know, that, that people have an opportunity to get hired to work on these projects, maybe from communities who have traditionally not been, you know, working on these high paying infrastructure jobs. I think the key will be interaction with the new governor, with the, with the new secretary of transportation, uh, with the Commonwealth Transportation Board, while the uh, uh, while the governor and cabinet secretary are you know part of the new Republican administration, the Commonwealth Transportation Board doesn't just expire. Those boards stay in place and cycle in. You know, there's a few people each year that either get reappointed or stay. So there will be continuity from the Northam Transportation Board that will last for some period of time, and and getting in and making the case for good projects and for making sure that the work that's being done, people, that there's fair access to that work, fair access to the contracts. Um, that would be the way it should be done. Thank you, everyone. The thank Senator you. does have um, another event to attend, but once again, thank you. And if you have any more press questions, you could direct them to Ilse and she will um, get any responses that you need. And for other public questions, you can direct them to me. Thank you, everybody. Have a great day. Thank you, guys.